You are listening to the Blood Bank Guy Essentials Podcast, episode 032. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Blood Bank Guy Essentials Podcast. This is Joe Chaffin. I'm still your host. Uh, no one's fired me yet, so I'm going to keep doing this. <laughs> I'm I'm really happy that you're here today. We've got a great topic. We're talking today about blood donors and iron. It's a hot topic in blood bank world, and uh, there's been a lot of discussions on it recently, both at the AABB and FDA level, and really internationally in terms of the discussion about how to protect donors, in particular the most vulnerable donors, uh, from being potentially damaged by iron deficiency as a result of blood donation. My guest is Dr. Jed Gorlin, and, and Jed is is someone I have looked up to for a long time, not just because he's way taller than me, but could just, just because he's a very highly respected and, and incredibly uh, erudite spokesman for, for our industry. Jed's a great guy, and I think you'll really like this interview. Uh, I also want to thank you for listening to the previous interviews, especially episode 31, the most recent episode, where we talked about the magic of Twitter and how blood bankers should be on Twitter. Ch please check it out if you haven't had the chance. It's really a, a fun roundtable discussion with some experts on that platform. So uh, I'm not going to make you wait any longer. Here's my interview on blood donors and iron with Dr. Jed Gorlin. <laughs> All right, everyone, as promised, I am just super jazzed to welcome to the podcast, uh, Dr. Jed Gorlin. Jed, welcome to the podcast, man. I am honored to be here. Uh, it's very nice of you to say. I, I want to let everyone know a little bit about you. God knows everyone should know about you already, but the, the abbreviated version of Dr. Gorlin's uh, very wonderful resume is that uh, Dr. Gorlin is a graduate of, of uh, Stanford University for his BS and his MD from Yale. You know, he's kind of going for the, the not so great schools. <laughs> um, <laughs> Jed is board certified in pediatric and blood banking transfusion medicine. Uh, and he currently serves as medical director and vice president quality and regulatory affairs of Memorial Blood Centers and Nebraska Community Blood Bank. And both of those are divisions of innovative blood resources. Now, J Jed has served in just a ton of leadership roles uh, with ABB and other organizations throughout his his storied career, and he's spoken and written and published extensively on too many topics to name, uh, both here in the United States and around the whole dang world. For crying out loud, it, I mean, honestly, bottom line is that Jed's the man, uh, and and Jed, I, I think that we can both agree that your 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 appearance on this podcast must surely represent the pinnacle of your storied career, wouldn't you say? Uh, it is absolutely the nadir, as you point out. <laughs> Very nice. Nicely done. Thank you for that. Um, so, <laughs> Jed, uh, today you and I are, are going to explore what, uh, to make a bad pun, is a very magnetic topic. And we're talking about iron in blood donors. Um it's a really hot topic. It's something that a lot of people are talking about right now. Uh, and I want to get to that, but but I I really always want to start with, with all my guests with just a real quick figuring out what it was for you that kind of set you on the, the pathway of blood banking. Uh, I know you have a background in pediatrics. Uh, what was it at, at what point in your career and how did it happen that you that you got interested in doing blood banking? So in most of the rest of the world, uh, blood bankers are hematologists, not mm -hmm. pathologists. Uh, at uh, Boston Children's, I was a pediatric hematologist oncologist, um, and I uh, had an interest in the non-oncological uh, aspect of that, uh, but it's very hard to sort of just do hemophilia or sickle cell and at least the blood bank was a safe place to hide for a while. I did some training at Puget Sound, came back and started the pediatric peripheral stem cell program at Boston Children's, and I think that's actually a nice example of how hematology and blood bank uh, can work well together. Nice, nice. And and uh, how did you how did you get connected with uh, with Minnesota? How, how I mean, you've been there for a while. Is is that was that your first place? out of Boston? 
So I moved here in 1997. Mm -hmm. um, I do have roots here, not roots, ah. roots. <laughs> nice. uh, I grew up in Minnesota, so for me it was returning home. For my Connecticut wife, it was dragging her kicking and screaming <laughs> to the flatland. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, so you've you've been, as I mentioned, enormously involved with ABB and uh, and served in a lot of leadership roles. For for someone who's just getting started in blood banking, for a pathology resident, for example, or a resident or a a, a fellow in uh, in blood banking, do you have any advice for them on how to get involved in in leadership type stuff or be involved in ABB or other organizations? Well, absolutely come to the ABB national meeting and there are increasing opportunities to get involved in various committees, uh, mm -hmm. even as a junior member. Uh, but I would also point out that local uh, blood bank societies are a wonderful way to get involved and are often uh, more than eager to have uh, anybody contribute. Uh, in my local case, that would be Minnesota Association of, of Blood Banks, but mm -hmm. I, every area has their own uh, uh, local group, and it need not be limited to the blood bank. There's also typically uh, across laboratory uh, organizations. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's a great tip. That's uh, it is an underappreciated thing. The re the regional blood bank societies. I'm in California, and the California Blood Bank Society is uh, is absolutely looking for people that can help. And I know that you're right. There are regional societies all around the United States. And I'm assuming internationally, but I, I don't know as much internationally. Is that is that true outside of the U.S. as well? So I have the honor of being the chair of the ABB Global Standards Committee and working with uh, things like the Asia uh, National Transfusion uh, uh, Group, the African Society for Blood Transfusion, um, some of the societies are a little more struggling than others, mm -hmm. uh, but they they are all trying to uh, collaborate in ways that heretofore has not happened. Nice, nice. All right. Well, uh, so I want to get to our topic, uh, Jed, because this is a it's a really important thing, and it's as I mentioned, it's something that that people are talking about a lot today, and that's that's. Uh, iron in blood donors, the iron status and protecting the iron status of blood donors. So we're going to cover five essential facts about blood donors and iron. But, but before we do that, I, I'm, I guess on background, why are we talking about this now? I mean, we've been collecting blood from people for forever, but why all of a sudden does there seem to be this big interest in, in dealing with donor iron stores? Um, I think it's a constellation of several factors. Um, as uh, healthcare gets more and more business-like, there's been more and more consolidations and increased efficiency of blood collection. Mm -hmm. What that means is you go more often to where it's easy to get, and one of the easiest places to get blood is high school blood drives. So we have been dropping the age of eligibility and increasing the frequency and amount, in the case of double red cells, of blood that we're collecting from younger donors, which is economically incredibly efficient, but mm -hmm. it may or may not be the right thing to do for their physiology. Uh, okay. So, in, and is there, is there anything that, that, has brought this more to the more to the forefront. I mean, yes, I, I completely agree that we're collecting more from from young donors, and that is a potential issue. And we'll get to that more in, in just a minute. Is there any regulatory push for us to consider this? Um, there is. Um, I think the FDA um, would love for us, the blood collection agencies, to solve this. They mm -hmm. really only have two major tools in their pocket. One is donor hemoglobin level, and the other is interval. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if we can solve it ourselves, then that will uh, not force them uh, to, to, uh, to make a regulatory change. I have it from uh, high authority, having had lunch with FDA folks, that uh, if we don't, they will. <laughs> okay, so so that's uh, the stakes are high. With there, we need to figure this out for sure. So let's let's start from the beginning with the first essential fact about uh, iron, blood donors and iron, and that's that's simply that men and women are different, and 
Uh, that seems like the most obvious thing to say in the world, that men and women are different. But how, what do we mean by that? In terms of iron, um, how are men and, women, men and women different? So men uh, post-puberty have a higher hemoglobin level than women. Mm-hmm. Uh, but men also have a larger uh, inherent store of iron uh, than women, both in, in muscle and blood. Uh, in part uh, because of the higher hemoglobin, there's a higher uh, iron stores. For the typical female, uh, total body iron stores are, are, are uh, uh, premenopausal female are between 300 and 400 milligrams. One unit of blood that we collect contains about 200 milligrams of iron, i.e. one milligram for every mil of packed red cells. Wow. Wow. So, so you're saying that Holy cow, so let's do that math, carry the one. That's a lot of the percentage of total body iron that we're, that we're taking from a woman with a, with a single whole blood donation. Uh, bingo, we take one unit, um, uh, we take one unit of blood and we um, have depleted much of the extra stores. We take mm-hmm. two units of blood and we're now dipping into uh, the, Total body iron. Gotcha. So, so how is that different from guys? Uh, typically, guys will have uh, 400 to 500 milligrams of iron reserves, meaning they have at least one more unit in their back pocket. Mm. Okay. Okay. So, obviously, in, in blood donor centers, we traditionally have not been, um, well, let me back off of that. We, we traditionally have, have not been... I want. I don't want to say we haven't been worrying about total body iron stores, but we're not. We haven't routinely been measuring it over the years. So, so over the years, we've used, as you mentioned, hemoglobin to try and determine uh, whether or not a donor is eligible. And can you just talk us through a little bit about how how those hemoglobin levels got set historically and kind of where we are now with that? So, um, United States um, and Canada were the only countries that had the same hemoglobin cutoff for men and women, uh, and that has changed recently, uh, both the United States and Canada. Mm-hmm. Uh, we now have the higher hemoglobin uh, uh, cutoff for men. Um, it historically was that way, and it was somewhere in the 60s or 70s, I forget which, um, that it was made the same because it was too confusing for us blood collection agencies. <laughs> I am not making that part up. <laughs> the yeah. problem with that is the hemoglobin cutoff of 12.5 actually cuts off the lower uh, one-seventh, about 14% of women, even with normal iron reserves, the mm-hmm. the standard uh, distribution curve uh, goes below 12.5 for for even people with normal iron. Mm -hmm. Um, For men, a a hemoglobin of 12.5 is three, almost three standard deviations below uh, the mean. So in other words, we were drawing men to lower levels than we should and deferring women with normal levels? Correct. And uh, if you actually look at... um, ethnic-specific uh, distribution curves, uh, that 14% of women may be actually approaching 30% of females of uh, African heritage. Wow. Wow. So so you mentioned that other countries, well, first, actually, before we get to other countries, how has that changed? Uh, you mentioned that it's changed recently in the U.S. and Canada. What, what are the new thresholds? So... Um, the hemoglobin for men was raised to 13, both in um, the CBS part of Canada mm-hmm. and uh, and the United States. Uh, for women uh, in the Heme Quebec part of of uh, Canada, they can draw women down to 11.5 if they are of African heritage. Okay, so so obviously significantly different. It, it, how, again, take us back to other countries that you mentioned. How does that compare to what's happening around the world? Um, so most other countries are either 12 for women and 13 for men or 12 and a half for women and 13 and a half for men. And obviously there's there's hematocrit equivalents, which are mm-hmm. pretty typically about three times. Okay. Three times. In terms of frequency of donation, is that uniform around the world? In other words, how often someone can donate whole blood? 
Um, again, the United States and Canada were the only countries that had uh, a 56-day or eight-week uh, uh, minimum interval. Mm -hmm. uh, almost all other countries have a minimum of 12 weeks. Um, in Canada, they have uh, changed it to a minimum of 12 weeks for women. Okay. Okay. Or at least are in the process thereof. Gotcha. Well, so, I mean, I guess the basic question that I have, Jed, is how, who came up with those numbers? I mean, how did, how did we get, um, specifically going back to the hemoglobin numbers, how, how did we decide that, that's, that that was a good range for people to, to donate blood? Um, I think, to be honest, it was more the convenience of blood collection agencies than mm -hmm. any given study. Mm -hmm. In fact, for almost any given blood collection agency, the average frequency of donation uh, typically ranges between 1.4 and 2, uh, meaning um, you're donating one and a half times a year or two times a year, and very, very few people uh, were donating uh, the up to six or more times a year that that is allowed with the 56 day uh, mm -hmm. interval. Mm -hmm. um, Whoops. So, so it, there actually is a wonderful study by Alan Mast of super donors, people donating uh, six times a year. Um, and he realized that he was thinking that they might uh, have a disproportionate representation of uh, donors with hemochromatosis. In fact, he found a higher frequency of donors who smoke. Oh, really? Oh, that is the, that is a, a different thing. Obviously, not something we ask about. Um, and, and nor do I recommend that we give out cigarettes instead of cookies. <laughs> Okay, write that down. No cigarettes. Okay, got it. Good. Um, <laughs> okay, so I think we've we've explored that a little bit in terms of the fact first the first essential fact that men and women are different. And I, so I want to take that a little farther, and and let's let's get to uh, to what evidence do we have uh, for fact number two, which is that blood donation really does impact iron stores. Um, so, so Jed, we, we had a, a really big, important study that, that came out, I believe, in 2011 um, that was called the RISE study, if I recall. Um, and can you take us through a little bit some of the, some of the important findings about to, to support that fact that blood donation really does impact donor stores? So there certainly have been a number of excellent studies around the world, including uh, Canada, United Kingdom, Ireland and Australia, mm -hmm. uh, but the RISE study was a very nice, well-organized study looking at um, donor frequency in iron stores. And one of the contributions it, it uh, made was using not just ferritin, but some additional fancier studies of iron, which allowed sort of distinction between um, absent iron stores and um, iron deficient erythropoiesis, uh, sort of two levels of deficiency mm -hmm. with absent iron stores being completely absent and iron deficient erythropoiesis meaning you're getting there. Mm -hmm. And what it showed is men or women, if you are female and donating two times a year or more, if you are male or, and donating three times a year or more, there is a very high likelihood of uh, at least being low in iron stores, mm -hmm. uh, uh, either the absent or iron deficient erythropoiesis. So to take that back to the beginning, just again, since we have a, a very wide range of, of people in terms of expertise that are listening to the podcast, just if you don't mind, t talk to us for just a second about, about ferritin measurements and, and what they mean. What does a ferritin measurement tell you about a donor? So free iron is a really bad thing. Free iron um, can cause you to rust. Uh, it is an act of oxidant. Um, and so our body actually does a wonderful job from protecting us from rusting. Uh -huh. So it has various molecules to hold on to iron to make it readily available to use, but mm -hmm. not to allow it to be wreaking havoc on, on various tissues. Um, and so one of the storage proteins uh, is transferrin. One of the sto another storage uh, protein that actually holds a larger amount is, is ferritin. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, and so typically if the ferritin level gets below 20 or 30, it's sort of a low level. And if it's below 10 or 12, it's a very low level. Um, there are fancier measures. Uh, transferrin receptor uh, uh, was used in the uh, uh, RISE study, mm -hmm. and it's perhaps a slightly more um, uh, sensitive and, and quantitative uh, receptor than ferritin. The problem with ferritin is it is an, also an acute phase reactant, so other f forms of uh, infection or inflammation can cause an elevated ferritin level, uh, uh -huh. which does not mean that you actually have uh, extra iron. Okay, okay. And <clears throat> excuse me. And you mentioned the two categories that the that the testing put these donors into in the Rise study: the absent iron stores and the iron deficient erythro erythropoiesis. I think absent iron stores is pretty self-explanatory, but c can you quickly help us understand what uh, iron deficient erythropoiesis means? IDE. So this sort of reflects the. Um, MCH, or a minimum uh, uh, cor corpuscular hemoglobin mm -hmm. uh, concentration. So if you have cells that have less than the typical amount of hemoglobin in them, that would be a sign that you're trying to make hemoglobin. You just don't have enough stuff to, to fill up the bag. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay, um, so kind of a kind of a maybe a step on the way to absent iron stores, but just not quite as severe a deficiency. And and we see this as mm -hmm. hematologists as pale red cells. Got it. Got it. Okay. So I mean, you mentioned that there were uh, that there was a significant uh, amount of of both iron deficiency erythropoiesis iron deficient erythropoiesis, I can't even say it, and, and absent iron stores in frequent donors. Was there a difference between males and females in that data? So yes and no. If okay. you look at first time donors, I, people we have not collected any blood from, very few males are deficient in iron. Mm -hmm. If you look at first time females, it is somewhat age, uh, and, and, uh, 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 menstruation dependent. Mm -hmm. So first time females who are younger, i.e. premenopausal, uh, can have a 10 to 20% rate of iron deficient erythropoiesis. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at high school females, uh, so <laughs> those easy to do blood drives, right. that can be 20 to 40%. Um, so we're, we're starting off with a group at, who has a higher risk of already being uh, low in iron stores. Okay. For males, that's essentially less than two percent. Got it. Got it. And in and in more and is it correct to assume that? So you mentioned that for first time donors, for for more extensive donations, does it does that do those numbers kind of extrapolate? In other words, is it le seen less in is uh, iron deficiency seen less in male frequent donors than in female frequent donors, or does it? Uh, equilibrate. So um, we have met the enemy and they is us. When you uh, get to really frequent donors, three, four, five times a year, 95% of them will either have absent iron stores or iron deficient erythropoiesis. So if you take enough blood, everybody is iron deficient. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> we have met the enemy and they is us. Uh, I, I, I know that phrase. Is that, what's the origin of that, Jed? That was from a Pogo cartoon, uh, I believe, actually That's during it. the Vietnam War. That's awesome. So, so anyone younger than us is going to go Pogo. I have no idea what they're talking about, but that's yeah, okay. I'm showing my gray hairs. <laughs> so I, I think that, that Rise, you're right, as well as other data that's out there, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second, pretty clearly answered the question for fact number two, which is that blood donation really does impact donor iron stores. I don't think there's any question about that. Um, but let's move on now to, to fact number three, which I think is really, really important for, for people to understand, because I hear this a lot from donors in particular, and especially when the, the male 
threshold in the United States went up from 12.5 to 13 uh, grams per deciliter of hemoglobin. Um, they said, well, I don't understand why this is a big deal. My hemoglobin, I always qualified before. So fact number three is that hemoglobin is actually a poor predictor of donor iron stores. So, so Jed, how do you answer that question when your donors say that? Why can't we just say, hey, you know what? You're good. You met the threshold. So it is true that if you are really, really iron deficient, i.e. absent iron stores, mm -hmm. that you are at much greater risk of anemia, i.e. a low hemoglobin level. So while it is true that um, people that are grossly iron anemic have a higher probability of not passing the, the minimum hemoglobin, especially mm -hmm. for men where the cutoff was three standard deviations below uh, the mean, there were plenty of, of men um, um, still making the cutoff uh, that were iron deficient and mm -hmm. recognizing that 95% that, uh, of the really frequent donors uh, are iron deficient, at least in their iron stores, um, uh, one can see that uh, we're drawing a lot of people that that are, you know, don't have a whole lot of reserve. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think that that one fact is is something that um, I, I, I speaking for myself at my blood center in Southern California. I think donors have the hardest time understanding that and that that just getting that message across it has been a challenge and we're trying to do that in in as language as simple as possible. Are you having those discussions as well, Jed? Joe, it's not just the donors. It's our own staff. <laughs> You're right about oh, that. Your iron's good today. <laughs> Okay, pet peeve time. We're, when when the uh, when the staff is telling the donors we're going to check your iron, does that is it just me or does that make anybody else crazy? Um, I I I'm afraid it helps um, confuse the donor and yes. gives the donor the idea that we are truly protecting their iron stores, which we, we have no way of doing in the absence of measuring a ferritin. Gotcha, gotcha. Very and very important. So I, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on, on fact three, Jed, because we, we've got a lot to talk about with the next fact. Um, but let's just see where we've gone so far. We've, we've said that, that fact one, that men and women are different. Uh, we've explored some of the history of the thresholds and everything. We've, we've talked about fact two, which is that blood donation really does impact iron stores and in particular discussed the RISE study. And by the way, just as an aside, everyone, uh, the references for the, 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 uh, the papers that we're talking about in this, in this podcast today will be on the Blood Bank Guy website on the show page, bbguy.org slash 032. You'll get all these references so you can look them up yourself. Uh, fact three was that hemoglobin is a poor predictor of iron stores. And now we get to the big one, the one, the one that we really need to dive into a little bit, which is that blood collectors really need to do something about this. So bef before we get to the specifics of what AABB and FDA rumblings are, Jed, I, I think it's important for us to, to ask this question. So now we have data that shows that blood donors have at least some degree of iron deficiency that correlates with the more times they donate that they have some degree of it. But this is not new. We've had people donating blood forever. Do we have evidence, conclusive evidence, that this is actually hurting people? So that's a little harder. Most people mm -hmm. that are somewhat to moderately iron deficient don't have such severe symptoms uh, that it's causing them immediate problems. Mm -hmm. um, certainly people, some people manifest uh, iron deficiency or low iron stores with some rather interesting symptoms, including pica, uh, a subtype of which is called pagofascia, or the tendency to chew on ice um, it's probably our body's way of trying to find iron from other sources. Mm -hmm. um, there are studies certainly in, uh, in other settings than blood donors um, that clearly show uh, other uh, uh, significant impact of iron deficiency, i.e. wearing my hat as a pediatrician. There are multiple studies showing that iron deficiency uh, impairs learning. Mm. 
that's yikes that and especially when when we're talking about the younger generation that we're collecting more perhaps than we used to that that does seem to that's alarming um iron also deficiency uh can decrease uh, sort of energy and exercise capacity which uh, certainly would affect not only our student athletes but all of those that are actually expected to do stuff yeah okay Okay, so so back in 2012, Jed, as you are very well aware, um, ABB put out uh, Association Bulletin uh, 12-03, and that followed some discussion that had occurred in uh, in November of 2011 at, at an FDA workshop. I wonder if you could talk us talk to us about both of those. I guess starting with the starting chronologically with the FDA workshop in in November of 2011. What kind of came out of that? So it was really a wonderful um, bringing together of the literature that was already there. Mm -hmm. um, And it did document that hemoglobin was a poor predictor of iron status, um, that there were um, studies showing that what we typically do to measure um, hemoglobin, i.e. the finger stick, Mm -hmm. is a pretty good measure of venous hemoglobin, but far from perfect. Um, and that we should have some allowance that 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 uh, uh, finger stick could be up to half a gram or even a gram off, mm-hmm. um, which was the reason that uh, the earlobe uh, sticks were discontinued because they were actually had a, a even much higher standard deviation of, of right. inaccuracy, um, and that there were. Um, pilot studies showing that uh, ferritin was a reasonable uh, uh, surrogate measure of iron stores. Okay. So it, now that did not, as I recall, lead to any, it was more discussion than it was uh, any regulation coming out of that, correct? Correct. So, but that was really the beginning of the FDA saying, hey, you guys do something about it. Mm-hmm. And so the mm-hmm. ABB uh, created an inter-organizational uh, committee, which included our, our Canadian colleagues. Mm-hmm. And basically the charges there were to develop a donor information sheet, which, which was done, um, develop recommendations in the form of the association bulletin, mm-hmm. and then... Um, monitor some of the mitigation approaches that various blood collection organizations were doing so we wouldn't be reinventing the wheel so we could immediately uh, learn from each other. Got it. So so that came out uh, in 2012, that Association Bulletin uh, 12-03, as, as you mentioned before. Um, so I want your I, I, I want your honest opinion as best you can give me, Jed. Um, would you describe the United States blood industry response to that as uh, as overwhelming in terms of the activity that it's that it stimulated. Um, so credit where credit is due, it certainly mm-hmm. stimulated additional NIH funded studies. Okay. Um, and and I think um, it's important to really have parallel actions. One, yeah. blunt senders doing something, mm-hmm. uh, but also to study the various options in a more rigorous fashion because um, the minute you do something as an entire organization, it becomes very hard to tell yeah. whether that was a good idea or not. Um, mm-hmm. uh, bad ideas are pretty obvious, but yep. it becomes very difficult to actually measure given that typically blood centers may be doing lots of different things yeah. uh, at the same time. Um, and so, you know, whether or not it's necessary or helpful to measure ferritin, if mm-hmm. everybody's iron deficient, do you really need to measure ferritin? Well, I mean, a lot of those studies were done in frequent blood donors, and so mm-hmm. uh, there still may be a role for, for measuring ferritin. Uh, some centers did. Mayo went to a minimum of 12 weeks, and showed that their uh, uh, deferral rate upon return dropped significantly. Okay. So I didn't mean to be facetious there. I, I, I Speaking from someone, from the perspective that I have, from someone who is medical director of a local blood center, I 
I think that it was difficult to know exactly what path to pathway to embark on when twelve when that bulletin came out, and so I don't mean to be unfair to my colleagues, but I, I think that I think that a lot of places took a let's wait and see type of attitude, and I, and as you pointed out, I don't know that that's incredibly unreasonable, but further some. In the interim, as as time went by, some some studies actually did come out. And uh, Jed, I, I wanted to call everyone's attention to an, uh, a commentary that you wrote in in 2014, in uh, March 2014, in a, a supplemental. I think it was a supplemental um, edition of Transfusion regarding blood donors. Um, and you, your article, your commentary was entitled "Iron Men Pentathlon." I love that. Uh, or we have met the enemy, and they is us your phrase that that I love. Um, I don't want to spend a ton of time on that because I want to get to to the kind of the the landmark studies. But but you summarized five studies that were published in that in that uh, particular edition of transfusion. Can you kind of just give an give us an idea of what those studies contributed? So, I mean, I think they were all excellent single center studies Mm -hmm. um, showing that uh, more frequent blood donors were more likely to be deficient in iron, uh, that replacing iron uh, did decrease uh, uh, magnitude of iron deficiency. Uh, but one that I thought was particularly at- intriguing was that dietary iron recommendations, while well-intended, uh, were simply ineffective. And so every blood collection agency I know has well-intentioned donors should eat an iron-rich diet and, you know, eat your spinach and and be like Popeye. Um, The practical reality is um, very few people eat enough dietary iron that they can truly replace uh, very frequent blood donation. So while dietary recommendations are Mm well-intended, by themselves, they are completely insufficient to um, replace iron if you're going to be donating three, four, five, six times a year. And I, I agree with you. That's that's such a huge thing because we have we have relied on that advice for our donors for so long. And uh, that particular study, which I believe is the Danish study, is that correct, uh, Dr. Regas? Yes, that, that, that one will be referenced on the show page as well, everyone. So that's a really important study as well as Jed's commentary. So uh, so those added some some additional information that kind of helped us understand some things. And again, the, the dietary iron was a big deal. But there are three three big studies, two in particular that have been published and one that I think is on the way to being published that blood bankers need to know about, quite frankly. And they, they are the, the AIRS study, H-E-I-R-S, the STRIDE study, uh, and finally the CHILL study. That's the one that to my knowledge, has not been finally published, but we know some information about it. So, Jed, can you take us through those? Can you take us, starting with the, I think in chronological order, with the AIRS study? Yeah, so this was actually a a fascinating study um, showing that um, hemoglobin recovery uh, was uh, much faster and better uh, if you took iron, and and while it shouldn't be rocket science that if you give iron to an iron deficient person that they recover faster, um, that's in fact exactly what it showed. So it took again very frequent donors, so women donating two or more times a year, men donating three or more times a year. So you've already it's a subgroup of your of your regular donors. Um, divided them up into people that were starting with a low ferritin, and they defined that as less than 26 nanograms per mil, or a higher ferritin, higher than that, um, and then looked at how long it took them to recover their hemoglobin level back to baseline. Mm -hmm. And in a nutshell, if you were not on iron, um, and you had a reasonably high baseline level of ferritin, um, it took you typically 90 to 120 days to recover your hemoglobin, which is longer than the 56-day right. uh, interval. In mm-hmm. fact, the rate um, of deferral for low hemoglobin does not come back to normal until 26 weeks, mm-hmm. showing that for most people with just standard dietary iron, 
-hmm. it takes uh, half a year to completely recover your baseline hemoglobin level, and that's not um, iron stores. If you replaced the iron and they were getting the equivalent of about 38 milligrams elemental iron uh, for at least an eight-week period, mm -hmm. <clears throat> that um, almost everybody uh, recovered their um, uh, hemoglobin level uh, to at least 80% of, of what it was, mm -hmm. uh, or at least the 80% of the deficit, um, uh, within, uh, within that 56-day period. And they were they were measuring ferritin, so we we have an idea of how fast the ferritin came back up too, right? Correct. Um, and so, um, if you got uh, the iron replacement, mm -hmm. um, most people were up to baseline by about um, eighty to ninety days, um, mm -hmm. and uh, often even higher if you uh, you know kept taking the iron. If you um, did not have iron supplement. Um, typically, it was half a year or more, um, and actually, many people were not even at a half a year uh, uh, completely back up to their original ferritin level. Super important information. I, I Jed, I know that there was the study came out in JAMA in in 2015, but I know there was a, a, a secondary analysis that came out in Transfusion of 2016 that talked about. Um, kind of the the peak time to supplement in terms of the iron effect and where the iron effect has the most impact. Can you can you talk about that, what they found there? So this was a Richie Cable's study that mm -hmm. basically showed taking iron in the first eight weeks after the donation uh, had the highest impact, had the highest yield beyond eight weeks um, while your iron continued to go, your ferritin t continued to go up, the slope of the curve was identical to dietary, just standard dietary iron at beyond eight weeks. Um, uh -huh. That doesn't mean that taking additional oral iron isn't helpful beyond eight weeks, mm -hmm. but clearly the place where it made the big difference was in under eight weeks. Got it. Um, and hence the recommendation uh, of of most centers that if you're going to take iron, at least take it for eight weeks. Got it. Okay. So so airs was was incredibly important, and and stride the next study we'll talk about the strategies to reduce iron deficiency, which was published, uh, I believe, in Transfusion in June 2016. There were several several parts to the publication, I think, but the the main results were published then. So can you take us through that? What did stride find? So this was an absolutely fascinating study. Um, five arms to the study. Um, <clears throat> one arm was a donor letter. So everybody had their ferritin measured. Again, this selected from frequent donors, uh, men two or more times a year, mm -hmm. uh, uh, three or more times a year, females two or more times a year, uh, but then divided them up into five groups. Two of the groups got a letter, one of which said, hey, your ferritin is low, you should do something about this, here's your level, and you know we recommend you take iron and show your doctor and blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. The other said, thank you so much for donating, you've saved lives, and uh, uh, you are a hero and other ir totally sweet but irrelevant stuff. Mm -hmm. um, the, the treatment arms included a placebo, um, and then iron replacement, but fascinatingly, iron replacement at a quite low versus a moderate level. Uh -huh. What I mean is if you go into the drugstore and ask for iron, they will typically give you ferrous sulfate, which uh, at 325 milligrams has about 60 to 70 milligrams of elemental iron. Okay. Um, and the reason a lot of people don't like to take iron is it tends to give GI upset, yeah. uh, cramps, dark poop, and other stuff people don't like. Uh, Nicely put. <laughs> the um, form of iron they gave had about 38 uh, uh, milligrams uh, mm -hmm. uh, elemental iron, which is sort of a moderate dose. Uh, but the other dose was a low dose of 19 milligrams, half that. And if you go uh, into the Costco and get multivitamins with iron, that's the sort of 18 or 19 milligrams is the standard dose of 
iron in in multivitamins with iron uh-huh. um and uh that's sort of a uh daily dose as opposed to the replacement dose that we're sort of used to giving people that have you know frank iron deficiency anemia and the fascinating thing was it didn't matter uh, in the study whether it was the 19 milligram or the 38 milligrams of iron. That was equally effective. And most amazingly, what was equally effective was the letter, uh, donor iron letter, which uh, said, oh, by the way, you have low ferritin. Uh, mm-hmm. What was not effective was the, uh, the control letter or, uh, not surprisingly, the placebo. Yeah, uh, that's certainly true. W- one question, Jed, and... Um, they say never to ask a question you don't know the answer to, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, that The group that got the letter suggesting um, they either lengthen their interval or take iron, do they know what proportion of them took iron? Um, there is some, but incomplete information on that. Mm-hmm. A significant proportion uh, took iron. Okay. All right. So, so that's, I mean, that's huge. So uh, there's a lot of things that came out of stride, but what you just said about being able to take a really low dose of iron and have it be just as effective as a moderate dose, um, theoretically, at least without the, the significant side effects, is that the case that, that you avoid some of those side effects with a lower dose? Um, well, maybe, um, Mm -hmm. what is clear is you have a significant number of side effects with placebo. <laughs> gotcha. So gotcha. interestingly, all three treatment groups had significant side effects. There was a higher dropout of the study of people on uh, that got the iron. So clearly, uh-huh. if your poop turns black, um, yeah. some people don't like that and and will stop taking it. Um, I would have a slight caution on over general, the, the results are the results, and uh, yeah. that's what they found. Mm-hmm. Um, in Canada, they did a very large scale study of sending letters that you have a low iron, mm-hmm. um, and it did have significant effect. The donors stopped coming back. Oh. Well, um, so while it certainly it. helped the donors, it didn't help yeah. Canadian blood services. Gotcha. Uh, the second thing is there are other studies, uh, especially in the maternity literature, mm-hmm. uh, showing that um, a higher dose of iron is better on uh, preventing or, or mitigating iron deficiency. Um, and the 19 uh, milligram dose is not as, as effective as the 38 milligram dose in replacing iron in people that are clearly iron deficient. So, um, and then finally, uh, understand that that people that sign up, you know, uh, for these studies, one, they were selected from really frequent donors, so they're Mm -hmm. already motivated. They signed up for the study, and then they came to the completion of the study, they stayed with it all the way through. So you now have a reasonably select group of highly motivated donors, uh, which may explain why this study found that a letter was just as effective, but the letter, you know, in the much larger scale Canadian Mm -hmm. uh, Mindy Goldman study showed that mostly they came back less. I gotcha. Okay. Okay. That's, that's fair. So, so good and encouraging results, I would think, but uh, your grain of grains of salt are noted, um, understand. So the, the last study, which is again, Jed, unless I'm wrong, which I feel like I am all the time, I don't believe has been finally published is the chill study, the comparison of the history of donation and iron levels in teen blood donors, um, that I believe was discussed at the, the, at the FDA Blood Products Advisory Committee back in in November of 2016. Um, Can you, again, since it hasn't been published, I guess we can summarize what's been said, but can you just take us quickly through that? So I was at the FDA BPAC meeting, so I I did hear uh, some of the results, but I I make no claim to, to having a a particularly absorptive mind. I think the major take-home lesson was that uh, teenagers are disproportionately high at high risk for um, low iron stores mm-hmm. and that even uh, moderate frequency donation uh, resulted in, in depletion of those iron stores 
Um, and so blood centers that pride themselves on four or five or six times a year blood drives at high schools uh, are probably um, putting uh, a more vulnerable group at higher risk. Gotcha. Gotcha. That's that's uh, it, it is sobering for sure, especially given what we've discussed uh, at the beginning about how. Uh, we're collecting more and more from from the young kids. Okay, so so we've just uh, again let's get us caught back up. We've talked about the five essential facts that um, number one, men and women are different. Number two, blood donation really does impact donor iron stores. Number three, hemoglobin is a poor predictor of donor iron stores. And we just covered the fact that blood collectors need to do something about this and some of the studies that have discussed how to do some of those things. So that brings us to the last to the last fact, which is um, and there's a little little bit of editorial opinion in, in here, I will admit. So maybe fact is too strong a word. But I think it's from the studies, I think that it's safe to say uh, that giving iron and testing for ferritin are potential good options. And and Jed, I know you have something personal about this that you can that you can discuss a study that that you that your center did. Um, can you just take us through that? Yeah, so in fairness, this study started uh, uh, around the same time as the RISE study okay. and was completed sometime around the AIR study. So it preceded uh, the STRIDE study. Gotcha. Uh, so uh, it's not exactly earth-shaking, but it was really more of a practical effectiveness study. One right. of the objections we were hearing at the uh, 2000... Uh, 11-12 FDA summit and the time the first ABB bulletin was produced was, oh, blood centers can't um, be dispensing iron. We're not, uh, you know, we're not taking medical responsibility for the donors. And so Louis Katz at Davenport and I just wanted to do, um, can we measure ferritin and can we dispense iron? And the answer is, well, of course. Um, now, in fairness, we did these studies at fixed sites, and typically our main fixed site, um, and one of the outcomes was the cost to mail the iron to uh, donors found to be iron deficient on a ferritin assay was three times the cost of the iron itself, um, and so while we showed you can do it, it doesn't mean it was terribly logistically practical. So there were two main issues. One, ferritin is not a uh, typically available or convenient point of care assay. Uh, it's best done as a batched assay. Uh, so what we were doing was taking a sample of the unit when collected, or in mm -hmm. the case of women with hemoglobins of 12 to 12, 4, a venous blood sample, um, and then doing that as a batch test once every week or two, and then sending out those results with the iron. Uh, so Dr. Katz uh, tried a point of care test, zinc protoporphyrin. If you don't have iron to put into the heme ring, then you will have its precursor, zinc protoporphyrin, flying free. So yeah. if you have an elevated zinc protoporphyrin level, you are likely to be iron deficient. And while that is technically true, um, it's not a... a test with a sufficiently robust positive predictive value uh, or negative predictive value for that matter. Um, and so uh, it's also a terribly ex expensive point of care test. So while it makes great science, it's not a terribly practical test to use for blood centers. So I think one thing that, that came out of the study, though it wasn't in the original published report, was that zinc protoporphyrin is not a, 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 a terribly... Um, a practical alternative for a point of care test. Um, the other was when we put people on iron, uh, when they came back, uh, their deferral rate was dramatically lower. Um, so we had something like a 23% uh, deferral rate um, uh, if they didn't get the iron and a 5% deferral rate um, if they did get the iron. So it, it's actually in blood centers' uh, f uh, uh, self-interest to yeah. ensure that our donors have iron, adequate iron stores. And, and I think what you just said about, about uh, how it can help you on the other end as well as doing good for the donors and the fact that it's feasible uh, to, 
to do this feasible, but as you said, not necessarily the easiest thing to do. Those were really important things that that you guys that you guys showed, and that really kind of takes us with bringing everything back into context. All the stuff that's been published, um, all the stuff that's been looked at. The the ABB tried to kind of synthesize all that. Um, in a, a fairly recent association bulletin, a, ABB Association Bulletin 17-02, uh, which kind of circled back around to the to the uh, bulletin from 2012 and expanded and updated it. And Jed, I wonder if you if you wouldn't mind taking us through the the basic ideas in that bulletin. So I mean, it's in our its heart very similar to the uh, 1202 bulletin, but I think trying to push it one step further. It's mm-hmm. basically saying, uh, stepping back and saying waiting for studies is no longer adequate and that all blood college, collection agencies should implement one or more uh, intervention. And mm-hmm. whether those interventions are directed at all donors or specific subgroups is really up to the blood collection agency. Mm-hmm. Recommended specific subgroups to pay attention to might be young donors, all of the CHILL study, pre-menopausal women, or those who donate frequently, um, you know, two more times a year for women or three more times a year for men. Mm -hmm. Um, Whether iron supplementation is best done by handing out the iron, giving uh, vouchers, recommending iron alone versus multivitamins plus iron, Mm -hmm. I I Mm -hmm. think would benefit from further study. And the guidance is very nonspecific about that. Mm -hmm. And then finally, um, uh, either lengthening the interval or limiting the number of donations per year. Um, I'm actually more attracted by the limiting number of donations per year because that would still allow you to... uh, you know, make up during a shortage period um, Mm -hmm. between Christmas and New Year's. um, But um, saying, you know, maybe donors shouldn't donate more than four times a year. uh, It's really the total number of donations over the previous year or two that has a greater correlation with iron stores than Mm -hmm. specific intervals. Um, And um, again, measuring ferritin, uh, or other measure of, of iron stores, um, you know, that, that certainly would help guide uh, um, interventions, but uh, with really frequent donors having a hev- very high rate of low ferritin uh, may or may not be actually necessary. And and so let's let's hone in for just a second on the lengthening interval versus limit donations thing because th- I think that's an interesting thing to discuss. We, I think we're good with the iron supplementation, and I think we the things that we've discussed already about about measuring ferritin and, and all that. I, I think we're we understand that those work. But I think that when blood centers see things about lengthening the interval or limiting the number of donations, we have a tendency to kind of tighten up and go, oh my goodness, because most of us are aware that. Blood donations in general are down. Thank goodness transfusions are down, but blood donations in general are down across the United States. And I think it's kind of international as well. And if we're going to lengthen the interval, you know, based on some of the stuff you said earlier, without without iron, we may be talking like six month intervals. So how do you respond to that when when uh, blood centers are, are get really nervous about that idea? So I will point out that almost every other country um, does fine with a minimum interval of 12 weeks. I don't know that anybody is suggesting uh, uh, limiting intervals to, to half year, which would be the, the, the natural uh, recovery time. Um, but certainly um, there are countries where they limit females, I groups at higher risk, um, to three or four times uh, a year. Um, I I will also point out that blood establishment computer systems are currently designed to make it very easy to adjust the interval to whatever we want. Mm -hmm. Um, They're not at all designed to count the number of donations in a rolling period, Uh, Uh, which is it would be it would be a bigger flog change. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay. Well, so Jed, the, the last thing that I just want to I, I want to mention is that I, I'm sure that there are some people out there listening to this podcast saying, 
okay, so you're talking about uh, you're talking about whole blood donation. How does any of this apply to apheresis donation? So can we close with that just quickly? Um, any any thoughts on that about apheresis donation and this whole issue? So you don't lose a lot of red cells with an apheresis donation. Um, but you do lose some. So one, there is 20, 30, 40 mils left in the circuit, depending upon the particular apheresis device. But more importantly, um, that diversion pouch, which we use for doing the infectious disease testing, uh, contains 30 to 60 mils of blood. Sure. Um, and this is, you know, not terribly relevant if you're like me and donate platelets once every one to two months. Mm -hmm. If you're going for the 60-gallon donor board and you're mm -hmm. donating 24 times a year doubles, yeah. um, that absolutely adds up. And so New York uh, Blood Center and others have done the study looking at uh, iron deficiency in frequent platelet donors, and the answer is yes. Interestingly, in the plasma collection industry, the FDA allows them to do the infectious disease testing from the collected product uh, plasma as opposed mm -hmm. to the uh, diversion pouch, which means mm -hmm. they're not uh, losing that extra uh, volume of red cells with each donation. Interesting. I wasn't aware of that. That's, that is interesting. And of course, if we're talking about someone who's donating red cells by apheresis, then, I mean, the rules are essentially the same, unless it's a double red cell and there are additional considerations. But we're, when I say apheresis, obviously, I'm referring mostly to platelet donations by apheresis. Well, I would point out that um, an unnamed organization mm -hmm. uh, had a publication that double red cells have a lower uh, adverse reaction rate because you're not changing the donor volume uh, mm -hmm. and and are therefore especially preferable in high school donations. Yep. Uh, and uh, <laughs> as the reviewer of that article, I objected strongly saying, yes, but that's the exact group that's of greatest risk in iron deficiency. Yeah. Um, and uh, one should have caution while Double red cells, again, may be more convenient in that population. That may be exactly the wrong population in which uh, to be doing lots of double red cell collections. I hear what you're saying. Well, so Jed, this is this has been great. I I really can't thank you enough for doing this. We've uh, everyone just to, just to remind you, we've we've talked about five essential facts of blood donors and iron. We've done men and women are different. Blood donation really does impact donor iron stores. Hemoglobin is a poor predictor of those donor iron stores. Blood collectors need to do something about this and all the studies that, that talk about how to do it. And then finally, giving iron and testing for ferritin are potential good options. And Judd, seriously, it's been an incredible honor to have you here. I, I'm wondering, do you have any last thoughts on anything that we've talked about or anything else before we close? Um, at the risk of being a little political, I would like to point out that the Rise, Airs, and Chill studies yes. were all uh, uh, wonderfully funded by collaborations with the NIH on the NHLBI yep. uh, funding grants. And uh, uh, if current budget were to, or proposed budget were to go through, the NIH would be uh, have significant cuts that would certainly um, prohibit any additional of this this sort of study. So I would urge everyone to be ad, uh, advocates for uh, the kind of NIH funding we want so that we can continue to do these sort of important donor health studies. Yeah, they are important, and, and it's good work that's being done. So, so Jed, uh, as I said, it's, it has been my honor. Thank you so much for being my guest today. Thank you so much, Joe. Hi, this is Joe back with a couple of closing thoughts. Uh, you know, uh, Jed and I have been working on getting this podcast going for some time. And coincidentally, right around the time that we did this recording, there were a couple of things that, that came out from AABB that I think are, are very important to call your attention to. The first was an AABB e-cast on May 15 uh, that Drs. Joe Kiss and Ralph Vassallo, uh presented. And it was really, really a, a terrific job that they did, summarizing a lot of the same topics that we discussed today. There's a lot of overlap 
between what Dr. Gorlin and I said today and, and what they said, uh, I would highly recommend that you get a copy of that discussion and, and listen to that as well. In addition, AABB announced the formation of an ad hoc committee uh, to look at iron management among blood donors uh, that came out during the week, uh, during that same week, actually, the same week that we recorded this podcast as well. So again, there's a lot of activity going on on this topic. It is, as I mentioned, a hot topic and, and a lot of things are happening with it. Uh, I've included a lot of references on the site as well as a bunch of slides that Jed has put out. And that is bbguy.org slash 032, bbguy.org slash 032. So my thanks to Dr. Gorlin and thanks to you for listening. I hope that you'll go to that show page and, and check out what we have there. In addition, if you go to bbguy.org slash subscribe, you can sign up to be notified of any new content such as this and stay up to date. That would be great. And, and if you get the chance at some point when you're on your computer, just run on over to iTunes and give this podcast, the Blood Bank Guy Essentials podcast, a rating. And if you want to subscribe, Again, so that you'll automatically get the podcasts when they come out brand new. So again, thanks to all of you. I hope that you have a wonderful day. And as you go through that day, I hope that you smile. I hope that you have fun. And above all, hey, please never, ever stop learning, okay? Take care. We'll catch you next time on the podcast. (laughs) 